All right. Today is Thursday, July 22nd. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. I got a great show for you. And let's start with this. I want you to pay attention to three things here. Number one, Delta. Number two, earnings. And number three, lumber. Let's talk about these one by one. Why is Delta important? Just in case you need to know. This is what I'm watching for. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America is back on top. How dare the United Kingdom and Brazil defy us. You want us to drop a couple of bombs on you? We're back at number one, beating everybody and reclaiming the number one spot in new cases for COVID-19. This is not the Olympics, baby. This is the real deal. We're back at number one. Now, while cases are rising in the good old USA, death, the number of deceased, isn't rising higher. And so long that this is the case, cases go higher, but the number of death remains low. We're not gonna go back to lockdowns and economic restrictions. And this is what the market cares about. And our leading indicator is the United Kingdom. Cases have been rising significantly in the UK, but the number of deaths is not rising higher. And the reason is, from what we know so far, the vaccines, specifically Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines, are preventing severe illness and hospitalization. Now, you and I are smart people. We're adults. You watch this channel and you know exactly what the deal is. The market could care less about cases, hospitalization, infections, death, destruction, nuclear wars, the end of the universe. The market doesn't care at all. The market cares about one thing, the cocaine coming from the Federal Reserve. If the cocaine is interrupted for whatever reason, the party's over and the market crashes. But so long as the cocaine continues to flow, we're good to go. Why is this important? The correlation between Delta and the cocaine. In the morning, we got this piece of news. Weekly jobless claims unexpectedly went higher to the tune of 419,000 claims. Once again, why is this important? Remember, the market could care less unemployed, homeless, who cares? It cares about the monetary policy out of the Federal Reserve. Looking at this number, 419,000 claims in a single week. Looking at the number of cases of Delta and the uncertainty, the fear, which will lead to people staying at home and refusing to go out and work and instead relying on unemployment benefits. And therefore, we see unemployment claims rising higher once again. The Fed will use that as an excuse not to taper or tighten the monetary policy. Every time you challenge Jerome Powell and you say, look at the numbers, inflation is rising higher. Corporate earnings, they continue to complain about inflation. Inflation is rising higher. We're raising prices. Jerome Powell's response will be, you want me to taper now? You want me to tighten the monetary policy now when we have delta uncertainty? How dare you? What are you, heartless? You want us to stop propping up the stock market and benefiting Wall Street and, and the 1%? How dare you? We got Delta, bro. We're afraid. We're scared. We need more accommodation from the Federal Reserve, which by the way, we know it doesn't go to benefit the poor, the middle class, the unemployed at all. There is zero correlation between the Fed printing money to the tune of $120 billion a month, buying bonds and mortgage-backed securities. There is zero correlation between this operation, also known as the cocaine operation, and between creating jobs or any prosperity to the poor and the middle class. But this is exactly what the market needs. If the Fed is about to use Delta as an excuse to maintain the current monetary policy, then guess what? This will prop up stocks, tapering expectations will be pushed further down the line, and inflation will continue to rise higher. And this will be good for the inflationary stocks and many other assets, for example, commodities and the likes. And most importantly, there was a consensus among market observers that once we hit the Jackson Hole meeting, the Fed will start tapering. You know, when all of these uh, central bankers meet in Jackson Hole and do their satanic practices. Well, now we know that perhaps the discussion will go as the following. Why would we taper now? Why would we tighten the monetary policy across the globe when we have Delta uncertainty. Let's revisit the subject once Delta uncertainty is out of the picture. So once again, Delta is important 
not because Delta is important to the market, but because Delta is important to the monetary policy. And this is what we're watching for. Now, let's talk about earnings. Yesterday, I told you that I'm watching for the outlook and guidance in these earnings, specifically what they're saying about inflation and the COVID dynamic. For example, when we talk about the COVID dynamic, certain companies benefited from the stay-at-home environment. Are they starting to lose ground as the economy reopens and we go out and about? Well, in the case of Snapchat, for example, we're not seeing that at all. The revenues, the profits for Snapchats are continuing to grow. And that tells us that certain habits that we have adapted during the stay-at-home environment will stay with us for longer than expected. But most importantly, what are corporations saying regarding inflation. How would inflation impact their bottom and top lines in the quarters to come? Forget about the lagging indicator from last quarter's earnings. You want to see what they're going to look at in the next quarters. And here's a little hint, by the way. After the bill, we got earnings from Intel. And Intel, this is a bombshell, by the way. They're saying that the chip shortage might drag all the way to 2023. What does that mean? Inflation will not be transitory. You hear that, Mr. Powell? If the chip shortage drags all the way to 2023, then we get an inflation problem. And most importantly, we can use this piece of information to make decisions in our portfolios. Now, Let's talk about lumber. Why is lumber important? Lumber fell down off the sky. It is crashing. It was transitory, yada, yada, yada. Why are we paying attention to lumber? It is exactly for that reason. If you watch the Powell testimony, every time his transitory bullshit got challenged by uh, politicians, his response was, well, look at lumber. Lumber went up high to the tune of about 2,000 and now it went down. It lost all of the gains for the year. And we're going to see the case of lumber replicating across the economy, from used cars to chips to grains, etc. Well, here's the problem. Lumber futures were up 10% today. And my expectations are that we will see lumber rebounding significantly higher. Here's a chart of lumber. The last time we talked about this chart, I showed you the Fibonacci retracement level of around 800. I was expecting a rebound at that level. That did not happen. And lumber went down to the next retracement level. And now it appears that this level around 560, 550 is working and we're seeing a significant rebound in lumber futures. You take a look at the MACD indicator, for example. The first attempt at the Fibonacci replacement level of around 800, that failed to cross. But now it appears that the crossing is imminent. And indeed, the 550, 560 support is working, meaning that we're about to see lumber futures rebounding higher. And if that happens, we will see a significant amount of short covering. If lumber recaptures 1,000, for example, it will create headlines challenging the narrative from Federal Jerome that the inflation in lumber was transitory. So watch out for lumber. In addition, we got some important data for the housing market. Existing home sales perked up higher and we are seeing active listings making a comeback. This is the first time since the pandemic started when we see active listing trending higher once again. In addition, the listings per month also surging higher, meaning that the supply is starting to catch up with the demand. But here's the problem. Prices continue to climb higher. And that tells us that the new supply is from homeowners who wanted to wait, who wanted to wait till the market peaks. Perhaps they can get a better deal. They got a little greedy and now they saw that the housing mania is starting to cool off. So they're listing their homes. But these homes happen to be at the higher end of the market. So why are we paying attention to existing home sales? Because it tells us an important indicator regarding buyer's sentiment. The demand is still hot. And if you have any supply in the market, if you provide the market with supply, the demand is here to pick it up. What does that mean? It means if home builders start to add supply into the market, the likelihood is that will be met by demand because demand did not go away at all. Demand is just waiting for more supply to arrive in the market. Supply will require more lumber. Home builders will have to buy lumber once again. This whole lumber boycott already achieved the objective and now lumber is trading at around 500, 560, losing all of the gains for the year. Somebody is going to look at this data and say, you know what? The demand is still hot. The demand is still healthy. Why don't we buy lumber now at cheaper prices and offer that supply into an already hot market? It might be cooling and pausing, but it remains extremely hot.
in bubble territory. Once that particular home builder buys a significant amount of lumber, and now we're hearing about wildfires in Canada shortening the supply, you will see more home builders stampeding to buy lumber. And that will reignite the housing mania 2.0. And if lumber prices surge higher again, like I said, the transitory narrative out of the Federal Reserve will be challenged. Anyhow, folks, these are three things that I'm watching in the market right now. Delta, it's impact on the monetary policy earnings and lumber with that being said let's see how the market finished today and here we go the dow industrial average closing in the green by 25.35 points or a gain of 0.07 percent the nasdaq closing in the green by 52.64 points or a gain of 0.36 percent the s p 500 also closing in the green by 8.79 points or a gain of 0.20 percent leading the market today was the technology sector and capturing the gold medal at number two for the silver healthcare the number three Three for the bronze communication services. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day led by REITs, financials, and energy. And this is perhaps the most important piece of information, so pay attention. The indices closed in the green, but the internals of the market are awful once again. The breadth is becoming negative once again, meaning that the market was carried higher by few stocks. And we know which one. The big cap technology names, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google. Yet when we look under the hood, the NYSE 25% advancing versus 72% declining. The NASDAQ 28% advancing versus 69% declining. This is a warning signal. You watch the charts, you're jerking off, markets going all time highs once again, but the internals are flashing red warning signals. Anyhow, moving on to futures. An apology here, the information is not accurate 100%. Lumber closed in the green by the tune of about 10% today. But this screenshot was taken as the new session started. Crude oil futures were trading higher today, both the WTI and Brent closing in the green by about 2%. Now, we have some bad news for oil. Number one, we have the OPEC agreement, the increasing supply, even though we have Delta uncertainty. Number two, oil imports by China from Saudi Arabia went down last month. Matter of fact, the Chinese are releasing some barrels out of their strategic reserve. And the reason is the Chinese are not happy about the rise in commodities, be it copper, corn, or crude oil. And they're using this as a remedy to push prices down. But you have to remember this. Forget about the demand. The monetary policy across the globe, central banks continue to print and flood the market with un needed liquidity this liquidity will have to chase assets equities stocks at all-time highs bloated valuations across the board so this money this liquidity will have to chase commodities and therefore we're seeing the so-called commodities super cycle even though the supply and demand dynamics might not be supporting crude oil to go higher but the tsunami of liquidity is stronger than the supply and demand dynamics you want to talk about a super cycle let's talk about softs we already talked about lumber. We're not going to talk about it again, but let's talk about coffee. Coffee futures surging higher, exploding higher. And by the way, I was making a headlines of the day video last night. I haven't finished the video yet, but the main title is coffee futures explode higher or prepare to pay more for coffee, whatever it is. I'm just trying to do the FUD you know, to scare you and make you shit your pants. But I have some logic and reasoning behind my decision because the facts indicate that the supply and demand dynamic is extremely favorable for coffee prices to go higher. And I will show you all the information and the facts in that video. But most importantly, coffee futures will become, if not already became, a gambling mecca for hedge funds and speculators from around the world to gamble on coffee futures to rise higher. Why am I saying this? Take one element as an example. Coffee futures trade in two main markets, New York and London. In New York, we have the Arabica variety. In London, we have the Robusta variety. Two different varieties of coffee traded in two different exchanges. Usually, they trade in synchrony. But now, we're seeing that the Arabica variety in the New York exchange, opening a gap with the Robusta variety out of the London exchange. I'll give you two seconds to figure it out. From a financial perspective, when you have that gap between identical commodities, it opens the door for arbitrage. You buy the cheap one in one exchange, 
and you sell it at the higher price in the other exchange. And therefore, we're about to see significant activities from hedge funds and the likes in coffee futures. So prepare for coffee futures to explode higher. They've already explode, exploded. You see coffee futures trading 10% in the green today, on top of over 5% gain yesterday. Coffee futures gained about 30% in a single month and there was more to come what about metals green across the board led by palladium platinum copper all trading higher the u.s dollar remains relentless it doesn't want to give up it continues to catch a bid from overseas investors seeking safety in the u.s dollar but metals continue to be also resilient and we're seeing a rally across the board in metals of course gold remains the conservative metal closing at the flat line waiting and waiting and waiting for more clarity from the US dollar. What about meats? Green across the board, feeder, live cattle futures, lean hog futures, all trading in the green. What about grains? Losses across the board, they give back, with exception of rough rice and canola futures. Now, look at the all in all picture in the commodities market. Where is transitory? How long? Because we see corrections, and these corrections are corrected pretty quickly. The dips are being bought in commodities. So when the Fed says inflation is transitory, don't worry about it. have some hope and faith and pray and let's hold hands well the facts disagree the commodities market remain extremely hot at least for now moving on to options, the big casino. What's going on here? Per usual, the hottest table is Apple, with about 1.8 million contracts, about 75% of those were calls. At number two, Tesla, the souffle, with about 850,000 contracts, about 54% of those were calls. And at number three, AMC, with about 740,000 contracts, about 65% of those were calls. Some apes are still buying calls, but other apes are taking profits they're not uh hoodling hodling whatever it is they're taking their bananas and they're moving away and this is killing the momentum within the ape community the shorties gave them a boost earlier in the week yet the apes are struggling to build on that boost what about the unusual activities in the options market today starting with the ticker LVS, Las Vegas Sands. The name reported earnings last night, excuse me, yesterday after the bell, and the earnings report was received negatively by the market. It was a bad report to begin with, and perhaps Las Vegas Sands made a major mistake here, because they're getting out of Las Vegas, and they're putting all of their chips on the Asian market, Macau and Singapore. Well, guess what's going on right now? Asian markets are pretty much dead. Macau, Singapore, there are new restrictions in Singapore. Meanwhile, the Las Vegas market is hot and hotter than ever. And this is the first time we see this dynamic, by the way, when the Las Vegas market is outperforming the Chinese market. I've worked in this industry for a long time, the casino industry. And if you told me back in the day that it will be a major error to sell properties in Las Vegas and concentrate on the Asian market, I would have not believed you at all because Las Vegas was dying. Meanwhile, Asian markets, in particular Macau, was thriving. So this change in dynamics is a massive surprise in the gaming industry. Regardless, here we have somebody bidding that we will see a rebound in Las Vegas Sands, and they're buying the dip via call options. In particular, they're buying the 50 calls, expiration date October 15th, with expectations that the name will rebound by about 6% by then. They paid about 2 bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $300,000. What about the trade for the ticker FFIE? This is a new EV garbage, a new IPO, in case you need more bags to hold here's a new ticker for you in this case somebody's buying calls the 15 calls expiration date august 20th and they are expecting the name to rise by over seven percent by then they paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about six hundred thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker skx this is for sketchers my favorite name my favorite brand and the reason is i have the widest feet on the planet. I have them caveman feet, Flintstone feet, and the only brand that I can wear is Skechers. The name reported earnings after the bell, and so far it is surging about 8% or so. Somebody was smart enough to see it coming, and they bought the 56 calls expiration date July 23rd, meaning tomorrow. The problem is, perhaps they were not smart enough to structure the trade the right way, because they gave themselves one day for the trade to work. The problem we have here is, 
that if the stock doesn't close above 56, the likelihood is that the trade will be unprofitable, even though the trader made the right bet. And the reason is the construction of the trade was wrong. Remember what I say, the success of any options trade, 50% the construction, 40% the management of the trade, and 10% luck. The construction of this trade was wrong, so even though the bet was right and the name surged higher after hours, massive gains of about 8%, that's not enough because the trader was expecting a surge of over 9%. So if that doesn't happen by tomorrow, the likelihood is this trader will lose money on this trade. The correct construction for this trade would have been buying the 56 calls expiration date next week and then they sell the 56 calls with the expiration date of tomorrow, Friday. By opening a spread, you increase your chances for the trade to become profitable and you lower your cost. This trader did not follow the rules and therefore there is a chance that this trade will lose even though it was the right bet. Anyhow, they paid about 90 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $700,000. Of course, on the other hand of the trade, on the other side of the trade, there is a seller, there is somebody who owns the stock and wrote some covered calls, selling those 56 calls. If the stock closes below 56, they end up keeping all of that credit. In this case, 90 cents a piece. Not bad at all. What about the ticker PLBY? Playboy, yes, Playboy. In case you are a vintage-based investor, you like investing in the past. This is, of course, becoming a Wall Street bet play, a meme stock, and they're pushing it higher and higher and higher. In this case, they're bidding for gains to come for the name by buying the 30 calls expiration date August 20th, with the expectations that Playboy will rise by over 10% by then. They paid about a buck and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about one million dollars. What about the ticker IPA? No, this is not the beer. I know you wish it was the beer. It's not. This is for a company called Immuno Precise Antibodies. In the morning, this company announced that they have a treatment for the new Delta variant. And of course, the stock doubled in the trading session. And somebody is betting for more gains to come. Watch out for this stock because it will become perhaps the next meme stock. They're going to bet it higher and higher and higher. And somebody's going to try to short it by buying put options. And it's going to become a battlefield. In this case, for this trade, they bought the 15 calls expiration date August 20th. With expectations that the name will rise an additional 14% by then. And they paid about 3 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1 million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker QQQ, the Nasdaq? We have a bearish trade here. Somebody did not get the memo that stocks only go up. Somebody wants to stay poor here and they bought the 335 puts expiration date August 13th with expectations that the name will drop by over 8% by then. They paid about 90 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $400,000. Now all kidding aside, the likelihood is as we head into earnings, look at stocks like Nvidia, Apple, Amazon, all exploded higher already. Traders and investors bought the news, excuse me, bought the rule and the likelihood is they will sell the news because when you push these stocks higher impulsively higher prior to earnings the likelihood is that earnings will disappoint and the reason is expectations went ahead of themselves moving on to the heat map analysis what's working today you know by now that the breadth of the market the advanced to decline ratio was terrible yet the market was pushed higher by very few stocks mainly the big cap technology names apple microsoft amazon all closing in the green likewise we're seeing some options plays for example in biotech names traders are speculating on which company will come out and say we have a treatment for the delta variant we know we have a company here the immuno precise whatever it is surging higher today doubling but now it becomes a treasure hunt and everybody's speculating on what name will pop next likewise we saw elevated activities and options buying for twilio nike zoom starbucks all of these names significant surge in call options buying pushing these stocks higher likewise we have some earnings reactions negative reactions for example from 
TXN, Texas, dropping after earnings. LVS, Las Vegas Sands, we talked about that one. We have Unilever, the ticker UL, also trading to the downside. Meanwhile, we have some positive reactions regarding earnings. For example, the ticker BX, Blackstone, they've been scooping rental homes, single family homes across the country. Of course, they're gonna win. Another positive reaction from the ticker CSX, Railroads. Even though the company announced in their earnings call they are struggling to find workers and they are experiencing wage inflation. They have to offer more wages, higher wages, higher benefits to attract workers. And therefore, my concentration in these earnings calls and earnings reports is the outlook and the guidance. How are companies dealing with this inflation? Are they raising prices? Are they paying more in wages? This, of course, will help us to formulate a picture regarding the outlook for inflation. If more companies say we're raising prices and we're paying more, then forget about transitory. The Fed can say whatever they want. At the end of the day, the facts on the ground from corporate America saying that we're hiking wages and we're raising prices on the end customer, then goodbye to the transitory bullshit and hello to more inflation. Moving on to charts, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. The pop, the rebound, whatever you want to call it, is starting to run out of gas. It doesn't mean that the SPY should collapse and crash, but it should start to consolidate or to pull back all the way to perhaps 434. This is support number one. Support number two, we have a gap at around 432 and then ultimately 430 and a half. It should keep 430 and a half. Let's say we wake up in the morning and we see the SPY trading down. It should keep 430 and a half as support. So long as 430 and a half is intact, as support there is no problem at all for the SPY. Now I will be extremely surprised if the SPY trades above 438 by the end of the week meaning tomorrow because the magnitude of this rebound is historic. I challenge you to find a bounce like this in recent history. You're perhaps going to find one or two but these are rare occasions and the technicals are indicating that our expectations should be for more consolidation if not a pullback to retrace some of the move to the downside. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY? Again a massive rebound higher at a 4,230 now the momentum indicators remain negative but they're starting to recover higher indicating that there is significant repair from a technical perspective but the damage is not all repaired. There is still significant dent on the charts, be it the SPY, the Qs, the IWM, they all got a nice dent from the last correction. Now, the expectations are that all time highs will act as resistance once again, and that paves the way for the most important question. Are we about to see a double top formation? And if that is the case, that will be an extremely ominous signal indicating that the SPY will go down severely. Usually, double top formations work as the following. You reach the same resistance level, be it all-time highs or a specific resistance level from which the chart pulled back recently. The chart retraces that pullback, recovering the losses, reaches the same point of rejection, and then it gets rejected once again, and you see a flush down, a severe rejection, a big down day. That's an indicator for a double top. However, if the chart consolidates minor losses facing some resistance, grinding back and forth, back and forth, this is a sign that perhaps we're not seeing a double top. In fact, we're actually seeing the formation of a bull flag gathering of energy just below or at the resistance level preparing for the pop higher. So this is what, what I will be watching for. Will it be a double top formation? Or will it be a bull flag consolidation? Moving on to the Q's 30 minutes chart. Yet again, defying expectations, and we know the story. The big cap technology names are catching a bid and pushing the NASDAQ higher. But the internals of the NASDAQ are not good at all. The advanced to decline ratio, the majority of names in the NASDAQ were trading down. Now, take a look at the MACD indicator from a 30 minutes perspective. Yesterday, I was expecting a crossing to the downside indicating that the NASDAQ is starting to lose momentum and we should see consolidation 
if not a pullback, all the way down to 360 and a half. The MACD indicator managed to rebound, bounce before the crossing and say, you know what? I got a little more in me. I want to go a little higher. Let's do a final act here. And you see the NASDAQ pushing higher and now claiming 363 for support. But you cannot extend it for any longer here. It is already overextended. At some point, you got to face the music and the momentum has to slow down. My expectations are we will see consolidation, if not a pullback back all the way to close the gap which is highlighted in the yellow bubble if not going all the way back to 360 and a half and by the way going back to 360 and a half that will not be a terrible deal at all for the nasdaq it is just a retracement after a massive move higher the candlestick formation from a 30 minutes perspective is showing a bull flag consolidation but i'm not going to give the bull flag i will actually give it the thumbs down that we will see consolidation if not a pullback in this chart and i will show you my evidence from the iwm's chart but for now we're looking at the continuous contract for the nasdaq a daily chart and here we are a v-shaped recovery going all the way to all-time highs which coincides with the level of 15,000. The momentum indicators remain negative, but significant repair has been done. The chart is not out of the woods yet. At any moment now, the momentum indicators could curl down again. And what I'm watching for is, similar to the SPY, the S&P 500, will we see a double top formation at 15,000? Or will the chart pull back and consolidate underneath or at 15,000 in a bull flag formation preparing for the break higher. And here it is, 30 minutes chart of the IWM. Once again, this was a bull flag pattern. The assumption was that the chart will pop higher, reclaiming 223 for support. But I told you I'm not giving the bull flag because the MACD indicator is indicating that this chart is running at a steam. And the expectations should be for a pullback, not a pop higher. And this is exactly what happened. The IWM WM going back all the way down to the support of 218, retested once, retested twice, and now we're waiting whether 218 will hold for support or will the IWM go down all the way to 212 once again. But this is how charts work. The Q's defied expectations, and the reasoning is the big cap technology names caught a bit, but it is extremely hard to push it for any longer. We're talking about the Qs, of course. At the end of the day, the Qs, the NASDAQ, will act exactly as the IWM's chart. We will see a pullback. Moving on to the US dollar, the Dixie. This is relentless. It doesn't want to go down. You beat it, you beat it with a stick, you beat it with a pair of shoes, you beat it with your fist. It doesn't want to go down. And the reason is, there is a significant amount of uncertainty here from global investors, specifically Asian investors. Even though Asian markets are starting to recover here, whether we're talking about the Hong Kong market, the Sensex, Singapore, all starting to recover, yet there is this appetite of buying the US dollar. Now, I am still in the camp that the US dollar will top and pull back all the way to 92 because while delta fears are attracting more demand from Asian investors it will also push tapering fears and tapering expectations a little further down the road and that should ease the rally in the US dollar now, from a behavioral perspective, when you look at this chart, it should have topped a while ago. It should have pulled back a while ago, and it did not. It continues to be resilient. From a chart behavioral perspective, it tells me that the US dollar is working these conditions, these overextended conditions from a technical perspective, by consolidating. But it is preparing for the pop higher above 93. I'm keeping that perspective in the back of my head, but for now, I'm maintaining that we are looking for a top in the US dollar, and that is dependent on agent sentiment and tapering expectations. Moving on to GOLD, gold, doing nothing at all, trading flat, and the reason is gold is the mature guy in the room. It wants to wait and see what the Dixie wants to do first. If the Dixie decides to top, pulling back, then we will see gold popping higher, and the expectations are that 1840, 1850 will be broken and we will see gold trading above that level. And of course, this is what gold bugs are waiting for. The problem is, what if the behavioral chart perspective in the Dixie works out and we see a pop higher in the US dollar above 93 comfortably? Then this will be a negative development for gold and it will pull it down all the way to the Fibonacci retracement level around 1,760. Moving on to the 10-year yield. 
consolidating around the critical level of 1.28%. Now, the weekly closing will become extremely important. Will yields close above 1.28% or below 1.28%? If there is any hope, of a recovery in yields that we should see a closing above 1.28 by the end of the week meaning by tomorrow because closing below that number will indicate that there is more pain to come and more pain will coincide with more negative news regarding delta now as i explained to you in the beginning of the video my expectations are that delta will not be a problem a major problem at least for now using the leading indicator from the united kingdom but if it happens and turns out to be that delta is is a problem it will cause mask mandates to come back perhaps closures stay-at-home orders it's a long shot but if it happens then we get a problem here and yields will close below 1.28 we will see more pain to come and by the way 1.28 coincides with 149 on the tlt weekly chart i am grabbing a big bag of popcorn and i am watching the battle between the tlt and the 10-year yield it's the battle between 149 and 1.28 basis points which one will win the weekly closing will the tlt close above or below 149 will yield the 10-year yield that is close above or below 128 by the end of the week now the weekly closing is important because it is an indicator of what's to come in upcoming weeks closing below 149 on the tlt and above 1.28 basis points on the 10-year yield will indicate that yields will climb higher in upcoming weeks meanwhile the rally in the tlt will come to an end at least for now a pullback and then we'll take it from there what about the vix four hours chart i talked about the consolidation around 17 and 17 and a half in last night's video this is exactly what the vix is doing for now my expectations are that the vix should try and attempt to close above 20 by the end of the week will it succeed in doing so who knows but the weekly closing is extremely important not just for the tlt and the 10-year yield it is important for the vix because a weekly closing above 20 will indicate that there is demand for protection why are investors flocking for protection insurance from a downside in their stocks portfolios by buying volatility if stocks only go up if delta fears are not real if the economic recovery is underway if core Corporate earnings are pristine. Why are they flocking to buy protection? This is the battle of psychology. And by the way, stick around because I will show you the put to call ratio. And it is stunning. There is a stunning development here. I'm watching 20 on the VIX. Closing above 20 will be a bad signal for the SPY and the market in general. Here is Apple, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Breaking above the descending line. And it appears to be a bull flag consolidation but i'm not giving the bull flag yet i believe that apple will go down as we head to the end of the week my expectations are that apple will remain within range and the range is it's a little wider than usual 140 as support and 150 as resistance until we get to earnings now when you look at the options grid for apple the open interest for the 150 call expiring tomorrow has over 100,000 open interest a massive number now this trade was losing money today even though the stock was trading higher ask yourself a question will market makers get squeezed in apple and buy the stock tomorrow pushing it all the way to 150 of course not the likelihood is that all of this open interest will either expire worthless or we will see some profit taking depending on when the traders enter this trade regardless of profits or losses closing the trade will push the stock to the downside we will see a pullback in apple this is at least my expectations for tomorrow it could go down all the way to the same descending line which happens to be at the same support level 145 that will be perfectly normal no major move for apple one way or the other until we get earnings and by the way do your homework and research the strength of the chinese consumer as of late specifically last quarter and let me know what you find because what i'm finding is that the chinese consumer is weakening not strengthening but hey do your own homework moving on to tesla the souffle what's going on here we have yet another rejection from 657 which happens to be the bull bear advantage line so far we know that the bears have the advantage since the chart is trading below 650 
57. In addition, we're seeing a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. The main question is, will the next leg be another lower low or will it be a higher low? A higher low will indicate a bottoming formation. And if the bulls manage to close the chart above 6, 57. They will gain the advantage, a significant one. And my bet will be that the bulls will be able to take the chart all the way to 679 by next week. However, if we see yet another lower low, then the bears will solidify the advantage, closing the chart below 657. And my bet will be that by next week, the bears will be able to crack the support of 629. What about Tulips BTC? And I am enlarging the MACD indicator because it is starting to curl higher. We're waiting and waiting and waiting for a crossing, a definitive crossing, one way or the other. For now, it appears to be that the crossing will happen to the upside, a positive crossing creating green impressions in the histogram. Likewise, the descending trend, the negative divergence on the RSI is also being challenged. If we see a break higher above the descending line on the RSI, then tulips are gaining significant advantage. For example, take a look at the four hours chart. The number I'm looking at is 35,750 still. This is the threshold that the laser beams have to recapture. We'll take it one step at a time. For now, we have a descending resistance line and the chart has failed to break above that descending line over and over and over again. Will the rescue operation by Mama Kathy and Reverend Elon Musk be enough to gather the laser beam faithful, the tulip community to buy BTC once again and trade above the descending line? If that is the case, then the laser beams will gain significant advantage over the bears. The next battle will be 35,750. If the laser beams win, then the next battle will be 42,000. And at that point, winning two battles, we will know for sure that the laser beams will be successful in breaking above 42,000 and we will have another rally in BTC. Of course, the sentiment is as important as the technicals. The psychology is also important as the technicals. We talked about the sentiment among Asian investors. Asian markets were trading higher, at least today. The Dixie, the US dollar is consolidating. Yields are starting to recover. So that bearish sentiment from the Asian investor is starting to fade away. And this is good news for tulips. Now the tulip that I bought after Reverend Elon pumped it is ETH Ethereum. We talked about this chart yesterday and I put my money where my mouth is by the way. I joined the tulip community. I joined the laser beams and I bought ETH. My expectations are that we will see a pop higher at least to 2500. 2500 will be enough for me. I'm not a tulip bull. I'm just playing a rebound here and going to 2500 will be enough as a target for me. But it could go higher. It all depends on the momentum here. The technicals are paving the way, opening the door wide open for a rally in BTC, in Doge, in ETH. The main question is, will buyers walk through the door? And if they do, then tulips will go higher. Because we have an example here in AMC. The hedges pushed the chart higher by short covering. But the apes did not respond by buying AMC. So that door is still open. But the door will be shut again if the hedges, the shorties, and the likes smell weakness among the ape community. If the apes fail to pop up this chart higher, then the shorties who just covered will ask the question, well perhaps we covered a little too soon and we need to short again. I'm enlarging the MACD for you here in a two hours chart to show you the loss of momentum and the imminent crossing to the downside. And here is the chart. We talked about the double bottom formation. We talked about the hedges pumping the stock higher via short covering. What are you waiting for, apes? Put your bananas where your mouth is and buy the stock and push it higher to 52. Because if you don't, the shorties will pile up again and push it below 32. Lastly, and this is the most important chart of the day, the put to call ratio. This is the daily put to call ratio chart for the composite. And ladies and gentlemen, we're now trading at levels that we have not seen since the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Why are market participants piling up and buying puts? What's going on here? And here is a weekly chart for the put to call ratio from the CBOE out of Chicago. Once again, the highest level in years, surpassing the elevated levels in put to call ratio prior to the COVID crash. What is going on here? Usually when we see elevated levels in the put to call ratio, it is usually an indicator that the market has bottomed. As we see the market crashing, market participants 
stampede to buy puts looking for protection and the johnny come lately is of course per usual buy puts when the damage is already done when you see these massive pops higher in the put to call ratio usually it is a sign or a market bottom but what if the elevation happens when we're not experiencing a market crash or a severe market correction it tells us that investors are buying puts buying protection in expectations of an upcoming downside perhaps a severe one could it be hedging prior to earnings that's explanation number one explanation number two is the seasonality we're heading into august september which happened to be the worst period for the market in the last 10 years you combine the fear element of buying protection prior to earnings plus the seasonality and you ask yourself a question looking at the charts the nasdaq the spy the iwm it doesn't matter which one it is we see these massive corrections three five percent and right away we see a rebound higher the market recovers everything and the sentiment is clearly on the side of bulls they're emboldened they're perhaps overconfident and this is the key word overconfidence market participants are too greedy but the smarty pants the institutional side is actually buying puts as we speak right now they're expecting a downside they're expecting a downturn they're hedging while us retail traders are buying with both hands buying every single dip this is something you got to keep in mind. Anyhow, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the flash PMIs, manufacturing and non-manufacturing. This will be important, specifically prices paid and prices received. It's yet another pulse of inflation in the economy and also another pulse for economic growth. You got to separate the two. Economic growth and inflation two separate things unfortunately even the world's leading economists fail to differentiate between growth and inflation the headline number is an indicator for growth prices paid and prices received those are indicators for inflation lastly what about the earnings calendar we have honeywell a massive outperformer we will see if the results justify the rally in honeywell in addition we have american express which provide us with important information and insights regarding the health of the consumer specifically in this reopening phase in the economy are consumers booking cruises making travel plans regardless of delta of course this will be a lagging indicator the report that is but the outlook the guidance this is the important part we should look for in addition the conference call hopefully these uh so-called analysts will ask the questions are you seeing changes in plans as delta fears start to take over are customers canceling their travel plans or are customers travel plans still intact perhaps they're vaccinated and they're not fearful at all regarding delta this will be an important component to understand if the consumer sentiment is not afraid of delta then delta is not an economic problem story it could be a health problem story but it's not an economic problem story because we're not going to see lockdowns. The consumer sentiment is still intact. Travel plans are still intact. Spending is still intact. And on top of that, the Fed has an excuse to delay the tapering talk using Delta fears as that excuse. The last thing is the headlines of the day video is coming out tomorrow. And the main subject will be coffee futures. But we will talk about Delta, we will talk about corporate earnings, we will talk about corporate specific news and market sentiment. So stick around for that video coming out tomorrow evening. With that, folks, that's all I got for you tonight, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.